Welcome to Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane, brought to you by the Washington Speakers Bureau. In this space, we will explore some of the most pressing challenges that leaders face today with the world's most respected, innovative, curious, and accomplished thought leaders. We'd like to welcome our host, best-selling author and co-author of the recently published book, Choose Love, Not Fear, a WSB exclusive speaker for almost 30 years, Gary Heil. This is Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane. I'm Gary Heil. Today's guest, George Bodenheimer, is a case study in humble leadership. George joined ESPN in 1981 as a mailroom part-time driver and spent 33 years with the company. Of those 33 years, 16 were spent as president and executive chairman. And during that time, George oversaw innovations that not only changed how we view sports, but he actually impacted how the game was played. George has also served as the president of ABC Sports. He's the author of the book, Every Town's a Sports Town. And George is a founder and active participant in the V Foundation for Cancer Research, where he still spends much of his time raising millions of dollars every year to help find a cure for the disease that affects so many of our lives. George, I so appreciate you being here today. Nice to see you again. Well, thank you, Gary. Uh, it's great to see you as well, and uh, pleasure to be here. George, would I be overstating it if I said in 1979 when they started ESPN that it was sort of ridiculed and most or a lot of people thought it wasn't a very good idea? No, that really wouldn't be uh, wouldn't be an overstatement at all. It was uh, it was really considered an idea at a left field. Uh, I mean, who the heck would need 24 hour sports? Uh, this was, uh, you know, really the early going of the cable industry and and CNN, when ESPN first launched, CNN hadn't launched, it wasn't MTV, Weather Channel, all the 24 hour staples that we have now uh, didn't exist or were in their early stages. So it was, it was not an overstate. <laughs> but like with many ideas that were crazy in the beginning, I went back and, and thought through the 33 years there and the continual innovations that the team created. And I just made a few notes, and I'm sure I've missed a bunch of them, but the crazy sports channel turned into six domestic channels, and 46 international channels, a radio station syndicated in 11 countries, reached 93% of the households in America, showed 65 sports, and that doesn't count. The multimedia presence that you created that dominated in market share, restaurants, books, magazines, it was a continual innovation. And Today, everybody's talking about innovation, but the dirty secret at a lot of board tables is that it seems that the research is really clear. We have a bias against innovation in many places and innovative cultures are really rare. When you've been asked, what's the secret sauce to ESPN? Your answer seems to be always the same. It's the culture. Would that be right, George? Yes, I mean, that's absolutely right. And, uh... You know, it's, it's the culture and it's really the people that built that culture that is the driving force at ESPN. And it's, it's funny, your, your first question about, you know, would it be an overstatement to say that uh, we were ridiculed or, you know, I, I usually take it a step further. We were really the laughing stock of the television business for a few years there. But what was very interesting was as we televised sports that no other network was interested in or had any reason to be interested in Aussie rules football, for example, weekly uh, boxing, college baseball, et cetera. Uh, we realized that every sport has a fan base. And if you were serving those fans and serving those customers, you could build on that. And I think that was that the earliest roots of ESPN, the, the few hundred people we had in the early going knew that we were starting to, you know, that we, we had some embers, we had some, some small fires burning where we knew there was a fan base out there and we felt like we could build on that. And when you looked at the culture and you could see the initial successes within four years, you were the dominant player in cable television and yet you kept innovating and you kept changing. When you're the CEO doing that, what is it in the culture you look at to make sure you keep it going? Well, for me, I mean, when I 
uh, you know, I was very fortunate to get with a, a company that never stopped growing and grew with the cable television business. And, and uh, what, 17 years later, I was named president of the company. I, I really, uh, I didn't, you know, I was named the president of a company on Monday. I wasn't a whole lot smarter than I was the day before on Sunday. And I knew, I just happened to be president. And I knew I had, we had great people. And uh, my whole view was I consider myself a servant leader. Uh, how do I help, as president, how do I help you do your job, whether you're the head of production, finance, communications, engineering, what have you. Uh, we had great people. So, you know, the, the secret to our success was really empowering people and, and letting them run with the ball and use their expertise. And of course, we were fortunate enough to have you as a, a, a guest speaker in one of our management meetings. And we talked about that all the time. And we, we really focused on our people and, uh, and empowering them. Um, and that was really uh, what, what has driven ESPN for, for 40 years. Well, you know, and, and empowering the people, I, it's, it's an amazing word, right? But, but more than a word, the concept of, of empowering them to do what moving forward. It had to be looking through the windshield and not the rearview mirror continually, right? I mean, when you, when you think about, you couldn't have spent much time writing a lot of job descriptions that have a lot to do with the past. There wasn't time. You were innovating too quickly. Were you an anomaly? You got hired really young, put in the mailroom, and before you knew it, 17 years later, you're the boss. It had to be part of the HR plan to hire young people like you and let them go. Well, yes, I, I, I think that was part of the plan, but I think it was also part of the plan because of necessity. We didn't have a lot of money. Uh, there was several years there where it was unclear if ESPN was going to make it as a business. So uh, if you don't have a lot of money, you're hiring young people right out of college who are hungry for an opportunity. Um, and, you know, I, I talk about that in my book. I, I could have not easily, but I could have easily, I'll use that word, gotten a job for probably four times the initial pay that I got when I went to ESPN. But I was, you know, my dad gave me the best advice I ever received about if you're passionate about something, that's what you should do. And I was passionate about sports. And, uh, you know, so I think there was, there was hundreds of people in the same, you know, thinking the same way I was at the time. And so we found ourselves here and we were we were really loving what we were doing. We didn't care that we were outcast, if you will, or didn't care that we were not in the mainstream of the business. We knew what, we knew what we liked and we knew what we were building. And it really, it really uh, turned into something. You know, we really focused on our mission all of these years to serve sports fans. And so that was the prism that we put things through. We may not have had a big plan or studied something for six months or had a bunch of MBA studying something, if we felt it served sports fans, we did it. And if it didn't work, we stopped doing it. And if it did work, we kept going. Uh, that's, that was really the way ESPN operated. Well, you know, it didn't take long around your management team to find out what sports fans looked like. I remember the day you let me hang out with you. I, I walked in and I walked up to a table and the first thing you know, this was lawyers and finance types in your management team. And this guy looks at me in a not very friendly way. And he goes, declare. And I'm like, declare what? He goes, declare, you can't sit here. I'm like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. So I guess I'll find another table. And he goes, would you declare? And I'm going, I'm sorry, I don't know what it is. He says, the Red Sox are playing the Yankees tonight. If you don't declare, you can't sit here. And I go, well, that's easy, Sox. He says, sit down, son. <laughs> and, and I'm sitting there, and for the whole day, I have never seen so many sports fans running a business in my entire life. And, you know, they say that innovation happens at the intersection of disciplines. Jobs used to say arts and science. But what I was seeing for the day, and you have to tell me how this helps build the culture, but the people running the business were amazingly talented people, but everyone was a passionate junkie of a sports fan. Am I wrong about that? No, I mean, you know, we had, uh, I think you got to be passionate about what you do or it becomes obvious. And we're obviously dealing with people that are in sports all day, every day. And if, you, if you're if you not into it as well or don't know what's going on or, or can't, you know, can't declare or can't talk sports, you're not going to make it very long uh, in the business. Uh, so I, I would say it's definitely... Uh, 
prevalent, maybe not 100%, but a very high percentage. Yeah, in a world these days that increasingly is, you know, hear people stand up and say, we're about shareholder value. We have to make money to be a business or we're wasting assets. But we were talking about making money and innovating that day, but the underlying mission of ser serving that sports fan wasn't lost on anybody, it seemed to me. No, I'm very proud of that. I think uh, back in the day, and I, I'm sure it's still true, you could walk the halls of ESPN and ask, stop any employee and ask them what the mission of this company is. And a very high percentage, uh, over 90%, I'm sure, would tell you it's to serve sports fans. And I, I feel like that helped drive the company. I would tell them all the time, don't wait for a decision from the corner office. You know what you know what to do. We're serving fans. You have a budget. Let's let's move forward. Go ahead, and uh, um, you know you're an expert in your discipline, and and we really encourage hands off management and let them run, as long as they did it with integrity, and honesty, and and uh, with the company's mission at heart. Uh, one of my mentors, Tom Murphy from Cap Cities, uh, had a great saying that I adopted. He said, "It's okay to make a mistake." as long as it's an honest mistake. And I, I love that. And we live that we, you didn't get, you know, your career didn't get derailed at ESPN. If you made a mistake, if you were trying hard and doing the right things and it didn't work out, so what we were like, next, let's just keep moving. <laughs> and uh, I think that's, that's liberating to people. What was the biggest mistake you can remember that you learned the most from? Uh, I mean, I, Probably the initial launch of our phone was a, a you know, we, we made a, a poor business decision to own the inventory. Um, and we could not, I mean, we were a pipsqueak, you know, we, you got, you're calling the phone companies for product and you got AT&T on line one and Verizon on line two and ESPN on line three, we're ordering, you know, 75,000 phones, they're ordering, you know, 750,000 or more. And, so we, we didn't have the scale to compete. And uh, I remember uh, it was one of my, it was the first board meeting after uh, Steve Jobs, you mentioned Steve, after uh, Disney bought Pixar. Uh, I was attending the Disney board meetings as I often did. I was not on the board, but ESPN was such a big part of their business. I was often invited to make a presentation. So we're sitting in this uh, Disney hotel in, or in uh, Orlando in one of those room floors where you could get up and make your own coffee and whatnot in the morning. And I'm up early. So I'm, I'm the only one in there. It's, it's his first board meeting, Steve Jobs. He walks in. I'm like, oh, it's Steve Jobs. I better go introduce myself. We, we just launched the phone. And I walk over to Steve and I say, Steve, George Bodenheimer, the ESPN. He looks at me and he says, I hate your phone. <laughs> and I'm like, there's some really nice muffins over here, Steve. You might enjoy them. <laughs> but uh, he was right. We had the wrong model going. Uh, but the interesting thing is, uh, yes, we were, had the wrong business model, but the people we hired uh, were absolutely dynamite. We scrapped the phone, and then we just changed our business model from not owning the inventory any longer, uh, from owning inventory to not owning it. And since that day, ESPN has had the number one sports app uh, in the in the mobile space so i mean we went from a mistake to absolute becoming a market leader uh we didn't dwell on it long we cut the, cut our losses we told everybody you still have a job let's get let's get to plan b and let's move and so what was my biggest what was the biggest failure during my term ended up being the biggest success yeah and innovation failures aren't really failures if you learn from them right i mean the, the, the idea that innovation is some blinding flash of the obvious or some one person stands there and gets the innovation gene is just a fallacy, right? Innovation is learning over time. Well, you, it also, you asked me, what did I learn the most? And one of, what I learned the most there was don't talk yourself into a business plan where you just get uh, intoxicated with the numbers. Hey, there's a hundred million phone users in the U S if we can only, if we only reach 1% of them, we have a great business. And who's like, well, who wants to think you can't get 1%? Well, if you don't have the right model or the right content or the right pricing, you're not going to get a 10th of 1%, much less 1%. And I, that, I, that stuck with me. Yeah, you know, reportedly, 
it's interesting because the other side of the business plan is that many people would argue that business plans could kill innovation because if there's a hurdle rate and you don't make the right ROI, you never can do anything, right? Is there any truth to the rumor that you started Game Day or ESPN News without a business plan? Well, the real, the, 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 the one that's the example I use all the time is when we launched a 3D network. Uh, the CES Consumer Electronics Show is the biggest convention in the country, as you may know. Uh, we were sort of dabbling in 3D. I got a call about three weeks before the show uh, from one of our guys said, hey, Sony would, would like to invest $10 million in a 3D network with you, with ESPN. Would you be willing to go to Las Vegas and do a press conference in front of everybody with Howard Stringer, the CEO of Sony? And I said, well, for $10 million, I'll walk to Las Vegas. I don't, you know, but the, <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. So we, we, we announced that we were launching a 3D network and it blew up. It was in every newspaper in the country. Uh, it made big news. It made news internationally. And Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, called me and he said, hey, I, I see you're launching a 3D network. Can you send me the business plan? <laughs> and I said, well, I assure you, Bob, as soon as we have a plan, you're going to be the first one to see it. <laughs> an absolutely true story. So we launched that business without really a business plan. And, and you know what? Uh, it worked for a while. It didn't, it wasn't long term. We were probably ahead of our time there. It didn't matter. I mean, we, we learned a lot and uh, we established a firmer relationship with Sony, but we, we weren't big on having to have every single thing mapped out in a plan to give something a go. You trusted your intuition because you were so close to the sports fan too. Yes, and we were a big business. And if you, you if you're not going to take you know use a baseball metaphor, if you're not going to take a few swings, then you might as well go home. I mean, it's so competitive with the business. Uh, we had big competitors, and if you're not moving and trying to do new things, you're you're not going to stay number one. But in order to do new things, you have to have a, a competence at it. It seems to me in the multimedia uh, digital world that you got into, you had to start preparing for that earlier because you were really early in that, in that field. So you could make some mistakes and still be the leader. How did you start to prepare for that? Cause that must've happened. I'm assuming way ahead of your first entree into the business. It did. We were very early in, in phones, in, in sports and scores on phones. And I honestly just in keeping with the spirit of this conversation, our people were like intrigued by, you mean I could get a, I could get a score on my phone. And then a year later, you mean, I could actually maybe watch a game on my phone. And it was all so new. It was clunky, uh, a lot of fits and starts, but it was like, that's our, you know, that's what we live to do. There's a new technology, a, a phone that you could, and that you could serve sports fans on. It all came together. And so we knew we had to move in that direction, even though we didn't really you know, have a specific plan or know how to do it. We had to just keep moving. It was because it was a perfect, it was a perfect alignment uh, of, of new technology and our mission to say, we've got to move forward. And, and it must've been a, a learning mentality in your culture where everybody was learning because there weren't answers to those questions. They'd never been asked before. Oh, uh, my, that's an understatement. And my, my favorite, my favorite, answer at ESPN when I was president was, I don't know. And people, people, when you're the president of a company, as you know, you get asked more questions than you can shake a stick at. And um, I, it became a little bit of an inside joke, but not really. Like my favorite answer was, I don't know. What do you think? And, you know, nine times out of 10, the person launching the question that you has a thoughtful answer or has thought this through or has an opinion. And it turned out to be a valuable learning experience for me. I don't consider myself a technologist. We were joking earlier uh, at the expense of our good friend, Harry, in the garage door opener. I, I use that joke for myself all the time. I'm not a technologist, and I was surrounded by technology at ESPN. And I had to have tremendous confidence in my folks because I wasn't, I never considered myself a technologist, and I, I wasn't going to become one. So many of the ideas that bubble up of the ones that worked and the ones that didn't work have to come out of that statement that became cultural, right? Don't wait for a memo from the corner office, which means George doesn't have the answer. Maybe you should think of one. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yes. You know, I, you know it, it empowered our people. And one of the interesting stories that, that I, I've heard you tell that I think is so indicative of exactly that mentality was your whole idea with veterans. Didn't the whole veteran idea stimulate from the one guy who wasn't really happy one day? Absolutely. Uh, but I never, in my 10 years president, I never turned down one single employee you asked to see me, never, not once. And uh, this gentleman made an appointment to see me. I didn't, I hadn't met him before he walked in. I could tell, you know, he had a chip on his shoulder or, you know, he wasn't coming in to compliment me on the, how we're running the company. And after a couple of, you know, brief introductory comments, uh, he looked me, he looked at me and sort of leaned forward. And I don't think he really pounded his head on my fist on my desk, but it seemed like it. He says, why doesn't this company do more to honor veterans and veterans day and so forth and so on. And, I mean, I was not prepared for that question. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm sure I don't know the answer to that. I, you know, why don't you get a few of your other veterans in the company and come back and give me some ideas. And from that uh, was born our veterans committee. And from that, we had our first veterans committee meeting. Uh, when all else failed at ESPN, if you wanted to have a, a, a good turnout for a company event, do it at five o'clock and have an open bar. And that's exactly what we did. We had a retired general from Connecticut. We didn't even know who was in the service, Gary, at ESPN. Our HR department is going around with a yellow legal pad. You know, hey, wasn't Gary in the Coast Guard? Uh, wasn't Sally in the Navy? I mean, we were put, we didn't even have it in our database. So that first event, um, we printed up, we made jackets for all of our veterans. It's the ESPN jacket with uh, their name ESPN's logo and the branch they served uh, in the armed forces. And with uh, the average age of the ESPN employee, we had a lot of Vietnam veterans. Mm -hmm. And so we presented them with these jackets and it was extremely emotional. Uh, we had veterans saying no one has ever thanked us before. Now, thankfully, you know, we as a country are doing a much better job of that now. But it was an emotional beginning to that. And it, it just took off. Uh, our Veterans Committee, which is still going strong today, uh, marches and parades, builds homes for veterans in, in, in the area and does a number of other things. And the thing I'm most proud about is an effort that we started at ESPN called Heroes Work Here was adopted by the much larger Walt Disney Company and uh, uh, to explicitly to hire veterans. And I think the number is over 20,000 veterans have been hired since that program started at the Walt Disney Company. And that, that was born at ESPN. And you could say that was born by that gentleman walking into my office and sort of you know putting it to me, if you will. Yeah, to a person with a mind who's open that says I don't have the answers with enough humility to sit and go, okay, so what are we really hearing and what can I do about it, right? Yeah. The other side, the other side of that, you know, there's a lot of talk about leadership and social change these days and our roles as leaders in companies and helping to foment change. That's one area that you made a huge difference with veterans, but it, it was almost in addition to, I would say what I could see at ESPN, which is the adoption of the V Foundation for Cancer Research at so many different levels in the company. That had to be a conscious choice for the company to get behind the research to find a cure. It was, and uh, my predecessor as president, the current chairman of the V Foundation, Steve Bornstein, uh, deserves the credit for launching the V Foundation. He, he brought the idea to Jimmy and, and Jimmy Valvano, and Jimmy adopted it. And, and uh, it got rolling in 1993. But again, similar to the Veterans Committee story we just talked about, we have a V Committee <laughs> that is populated by the most earnest, caring, effective employees from all ranks who are committed to raising money to support the V Foundation and world-class research. And, you know, you know, as well as anybody that, you know, things take, you know, 
really effective teams to operate. And this committee has done more within ESPN than not only inculcate the B Foundation culture in the ESPN, but vice versa. And it's just a powerful, powerful thing that helps build the culture of ESPN. I personally believe that a, most, if not all employees, want to believe or want to know that their company stands for more than just making money. And yes, we made a lot of money over the years, but our people also know that we stand for helping fight cancer, Special Olympics, Boys and Girls Club, and it's a much lengthier list than I'll give right here, but they know we stand for giving back. And we were willing to let our people have time off in causes that were important to them. And, you know, I think, I think it's important to show you have a heart. And maybe that's more, maybe that's more true now than ever, but I, it, it's worked at ESPN. I would argue that it probably is underserved in so many places and works almost everywhere. And, you know, channeling your inner Victor Frankl saying that, you know, people exist to find meaning in their lives and you give me more chances to find meaning when you adopt things that are meaningful to me. And one of the things that was really true in the short time I got to spend around your team was that those things, whether it was serving the sports fan as a mission or the B Foundation or those things were dear to their heart, made a difference in everybody's life. I think it's not as well understood as it should be, right? As far as building a culture. I think so. We've, we, we, we've done a number of things. That we did a number of things as management teams over the years that were powerful. We were in New Orleans after Katrina, uh, helping rebuild you know, some things down in Louisiana. And it was, it was just powerful. And uh, there's a lot of people who, you know, we're, we're all blessed. We're, many of us are blessed. We're very fortunate. And uh, to give back to people who are less fortunate is, is a powerful, powerful thing. You know, in, in cultures that are really innovative, one of the things that <clears throat> it seems to me is that there's, it's a culture that, you know, I'm, I'd almost termed like a celebrated discontent. They're, they're discontent, they're not getting better faster. At the same time, they take time to celebrate what they've done, what they've accomplished, the, the causes they've given to you. And notoriously, ESPN obviously was innovating really quickly, but the celebrations were seismic in nature. I remember somebody holding up an ESPN hat from the 25th anniversary that said something like, I am ESPN. Was that a conscious thing on your part to make sure that the celebrations stayed pretty visible? Well, I think uh, from, it's funny you say that because from the early going, I think just both the nature of the business, the age of the average employee and the sort of crazy hours of having a startup, it was a, it was a hard charging place, let us, let us say that. We, we, we enjoyed ourselves. And we had some big celebrations at the 10th, the 15th, the 20th, the 25th anniversary you referenced was a blowout at, at, a, at a, uh, you know, our sports bar, which is an under <laughs> in uh, Times Square. Uh, and so we, we had a lot of good parties, but it, it, but people took pride in the company. I mean, they were more than a party as you're pointing out and, and people were very dedicated to it. You know, one interesting anecdote is um, by the time we were 30 uh, in 1999, sorry, 2009, uh, we had just come out of that uh, the recession. We were in a recession and times were difficult. And we said to ourselves, we're not, we're, we're, we can't just throw another party. Uh, we, we, gotta, we gotta change it up. And uh, we, decided to do two things for the 30th, devote 30,000 hours of community service, which our employees blew through. I thought it was gonna be harder to get to 30 than it was. Our, our employees blew through that number. But also one of the biggest innovations in the company's history was born in that was, let's do 30 films covering the last 30 years. And that was how 30 for 30 was born and named. And that's been one of the biggest home runs at ESPN history. And that it all came out of the, we can't throw another party. Let's do something a bit more meaningful this year. And those <laughs> two things came out of that. I and had no idea. 
the, the party theory of innovation is pretty good. I like that. <laughs> um, you know, today, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about this. Today, as we sit on Zoom and in our sequestered worlds, trying to build cultures that approximate the kind of passion that you witnessed for a couple decades in your business, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how a leader builds that kind of culture in a different kind of environment where we're so socially separated? I mean, that is a really good question. I, I doing my share of Zoom calls and they're great, but they're not the same as walking down the hallway and sitting in somebody's office or going out after work for, you know, spend a little time together or something. I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that one. I, 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 I think, you know, I think people are struggling with that. And uh, I'll have to give that one a little bit more thought or give you my favorite answer. I don't know, you know, what do you think? <laughs> it's a tough one. I think it's, it's really tough. And I think we've seen a, a backlash to it too. At first, well, we could do this, right, without an office. And then you realize the social aspect of being human and the cultural development aspects are suffer even if we are safer for, for that matter now. Yeah, I, I, I wish I had a, a better answer for you on that one, Gary. I, I, I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges. It's, it's hard to run a company from your, your, off, your, your office on the second floor of your house or your, your dining room table. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I, I, I think that that becomes a really tough one. One last question about this um, is that, you know, we, we talk about leadership a lot. Right, and you develop leaders, and you grew to 5,000 roughly employees from the small beginnings that you had. And who you call a leader determines a lot of what your culture is, right? Because you represent the CEO, you represent the brand, you represent the mission when they call you a leader. Um, when asked about that, I, I've often heard you say that, and I'm not sure it'd be your definition of leadership, but you've often said besides maybe quoting your parents uh, about the golden rule, is that the leader makes everybody else better. Is that how you think about it? Is that how you thought about it at ESPN? Or is, I'm sure there's more to it than that. No, uh, there really isn't. Uh, we, I used to say I'm a mailroom guy. I like to keep things simple. And uh, we, we developed a, a definition of leadership that was very simple. It was leaders make other people better. And if you want to be a leader, then that's what you should do. And we all know how to make other people better. Either you serve as a mentor or help them when they're ill or when they're overloaded with a project, we can all help other people be better, compliment them when they, you know, when they deserve it, give them constructive praise or criticism when they deserve that too. And uh, we invited everybody in the company to become leaders if they wish to. It wasn't any pressure. If you didn't feel like you wanted that mantle, uh, you didn't have to have to, live up to that. But if you wanted to be a leader, that was our definition. And we, we would talk about that all the time and, and promoted people. We call them culture carriers that we believe embodied the culture of the company. And part of it was being a leader and helping other people. When I used to run the meetings, the worst thing you could do was come to a meeting and be the only one with a certain piece of information. Unless you just got that information a minute before you walked into the, the meeting, I found that unacceptable. You should share information before a meeting so other people have a chance to think about it. We all know where it came from or the cream will rise to the top, but I, I, didn't, I didn't want the solo warriors. I wanted people who wanted to share and make other people better. That was, that was our definition of, of leadership. And I would say 60 to 70% of the people you know, felt like that was something they aspired to. It's not for everybody, and that's fine too. But a, a, a vast majority, I feel, embrace that. It goes back to innovation again, right? Innovation's a team sport, no matter how you look at it. The brilliant innovation gene doesn't land many places. And so if it's a team sport, I guess the fuel of that innovation has got to be information that's shared, right? I think so, uh, you know. That, that's power to me. And that's also confidence. It's not confidence to be the only one sitting there with this 
here's what I have and nobody else has it. That's not power. It's power is when you share. And again, everybody knows where it came from and, and, and so forth and so on. That's what I tried to encourage. And today, diversity is getting a lot of, uh, of attention for a lot of reasons today. But almost all the research on innovation talks about diversity, gender diversity, ethnic diversity, but diversity of views express diversity. And this sharing of information and confronting each other, disagreeing, how did you handle that? Well, we try to do it with civility and, and you know, good behavior. Um, so, you know, we encouraged it. We demanded civility. Uh, we, we had a, what we called a no silos policy. I mean, you couldn't operate your department in a silo and sort of not care about what other departments did or, or sharing the information. So I, I, I guess my answer to your question is, we just wouldn't accept that kind of behavior. And we would, we would root out the folks who just couldn't be, you know, couldn't operate in that mode. Um, and we promoted and encouraged those who could. I mean, I learned a long time ago, nothing says more about you as a manager than who you promote, nothing. You can say all you want. You can write down things and post them on the wall. You can do whatever you want. But everybody sees who gets promoted. And nothing really speaks louder than that. Boy, well said, that is. George, what are you reading these days? What am I reading? Uh, I'm actually reading a uh, autobiography of Johnny Cash. Uh, <laughs> long been a fan of his. And I, uh, I, I, I like to uh, read biographies of musicians because they have held interesting lives. And uh, Johnny Cash is certainly uh, no exception. So that's what I'm reading and I'm enjoying. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting too that what we read makes such a difference in our lives and what we think about. And it rarely is the reading everything that's just in one vein. The more diverse stuff we read, the more diverse information we have, the more, more creatively we think. It's sort of it's the research, and I wonder if I wonder if we shouldn't support that in some way or encourage that in more places that want to be innovative. Well, I think that uh, I think that sounds smart. Two leaders, living or dead, who most influenced your thinking or you, or you most admire? Well, I would say uh, my I would say my mother and father, uh, one who is alive and one who is no longer with us, but they were both really my, my mentors. I learned everything from them. My dad didn't graduate from high school, but he's probably the smartest guy I ever met, uh, knew how to handle things and uh, good relationships with people. And uh, same goes for my mom. So they're, I, whatever I am, I, I owe to them. Give me one more if you can think of one. Uh, I'm a fan of Abe Lincoln, uh, for obvious reasons, but he's, he's, uh, holds a special place there. Uh, Tom Murphy at Cap Cities, ABC, uh, never, you know, all you needed was a handshake with Tom Murphy. You didn't need a contract and, uh, he lived by his word, which, uh, was something I tried to live, live by as well. So how's that for a collection? Abe Lincoln, Great. my parents, and Tom Murphy. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a good team to me. So a Gen Z, a young person, millennial Gen Z comes up and says, Mr. Bodenheimer, you've been so successful. You've been through it. You've made mistakes. You've had successes. Uh, what one piece of advice, one piece of advice would you give me that would help me shorten my trails? I would say if it's literally one piece of advice, I would say simply do what you say you are going to do. If you do that, I think that probably separates you from at least some big number of people who tell you they'll do things and they can't, they just won't or they forget or they lose track or they lose their focus. So I, I would say do what you say you're going to do. George. I can't thank you enough for taking some time to spend with us this morning. Uh, I thank you for your wisdom, but I thank you for a long history of humility and being a role model for many of us who have, have known you for a while. I thank you for that and uh, for taking the time. 
And I'd also like to thank the Washington Speakers Bureau for making this conversation possible. Their commitment to helping find new ways to build cultures that release human potential has been really instrumental to all of our work. I, I thank them for that. And I thank you for watching. If you have some comments or suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks again, George. Hope to see you soon. Thank you, Gary.